Hello, hello, and welcome. I'm Meron Kilili. We are DM25, a radical political movement for Europe, and this is our regular live coordinating call with subversive ideas you won't hear anywhere else. And today we're looking at the far right on the rise in Europe. Anti-democratic, Eurosceptic and xenophobic parties across the continent have made significant gains recently. Viktor Orban in Hungary has just returned to power for the fourth time. In Spain, the far right Vox party has entered regional government now. In Sweden, the Democrats party is polling at 20%. Same with the Freedom Party in Austria, not to mention Italy with far right leaders like Matteo Salvini flying high, along with Giorgia Maloney, who's currently polling even higher than Salvini. And it's not just a gate about gaining power either. Um, the far right has proved how it can successfully move the establishment's agenda closer to what it wants, hardening policies and public discourse on issues like immigration and security. And the latest battleground for the far right is, of course, France where Macron is facing off against Le Pen in the second round of the French presidential elections, but this time Le Pen actually has a chance of winning. So instead of defeating the far right, Macron's establishment policies appear to have fed it. In France, what should progressives do now? Reluctantly support Macron once again. What does the rise of nationalist, anti-immigrant and EU critical politicians across Europe tell us? about our own failures and how we could fight back. Our panel, including our own Yanis Varoufakis, will be giving their take on these issues and answering your questions. You out there, if you've got thoughts, ideas, comments, rants, concerns, anything about the far right, about the French elections, or just ideas that you'd like to throw at us, then please do put them in the YouTube chat. If you're not watching this live, why not? But if you're not, then please put them in the comments section of um, YouTube. And we can also answer them there. But for now, let's kick it off. Over to you, Yanis. Thank you, Maren. Good evening, everyone. Or good morning if you are in some other part of the world. France's general election, presidential election, I should say, uh, is a wonderful opportunity to reassert the reasons why we created DiEM25. Because if you look at our manifesto, February 2016, it's all in there. What we are saying is that the authoritarian construction, cartel-like construction of the European Union, uh, guaranteed that there would be an interplay between the authoritarianism of the establishment, which crushed the Greek government, the Irish government, the Spanish government, uh, French politics, you know, progressive politics, um, imposed uh, austerity in Germany, hmm, across Europe. There would be an interplay between this establishment on the one hand and a nativist, anti-European, populist, right-wing, xenophobic uh, reaction to this establishment. It's clear in our manifesto. I want to recite the lines in order to give an incentive to those of you who have read it but forgotten about it to go back and revisit it, and to those who haven't read it to actually read it, because now we even have a, a new version that has just been voted in, I believe, or is about to be voted in. Um, the developments after 2016 uh, just confirmed that perspective. Very soon after that, we had Brexit in Britain, which pitched a nationalist Brexiteer strand against uh, the Blairism or Cameronism of the extreme center. We had um, Trump in the United States, we had Bolsonaro, we had, uh, in a sense, the European Union, it was like the incubator of this clash between what we in DiEM25 immediately spotted and described as this antagonist between uh, a nationalist authoritarianism, that of Le Pen, that of Trump, that of, of the right-wing Brexiteers, versus an establishment authoritarianism, that of um, uh, Hillary Clinton, of Joe Biden today, of Angela Merkel, of uh, Manuel Macron. Now, the point we were making was that the standard narrative 
of the Financial Times, of the Times, of Le Monde, and so on, was completely wrong. The standard narrative, what it tried to convince us, is that there is a clash between Macron and Le Pen. It is that, that it is as simple as that. The forces of liberal rationality versus the forces of illiberal nativism. And that, that's it. There is a clash of civilizations, in a sense. That's the standard narrative. And Macron was hailed as the young man who would uh, lead uh, without leaning to the left or to the right, would lead the struggle for liberal rationality against the liberal irrationality of Le Pen. Uh, our position was very different. Our position was, if you remember, uh, we were saying things like um, that Macron should have um, a little icon, a picture of Le Pen on his bedside table, and he should pray to her every night, because without her, he would never be prime, uh, prime minister, president, which is true, right? He only got scored 20 something percent in the first round. And again, this year, it's only the fear of Le Pen's rise that allowed him to be prime minister or president. Similarly, Merkel, why was Merkel successful? She was successful because it was either her or the alternative for Deutschland, in a sense. It was either this liberal establishment, her and Sigmar Gabriel, the SPD, the center, the radical center banding together versus, you know, the, uh, the Urbans, the Le Pens, the Georgia Melonis, the uh, Salvinis of the world. But in reality, Macron needed Le Pen and Le Pen needed Macron because without the toxic authoritarian austerian policies of the extreme center, there would be no discontent in the uh, former left-wing areas around Paris, in Marseille, and so on, to feed the monster of the nationalist nativists like Le Pen. Uh, now, many uh, opponents of us, of the M25, critics of us, accused us of um, trying to keep an equal distance between Le Pen and Macron. We never did that. It was very clear, remember four years ago, in the second round, we came out after we had an internal referendum, electronic, an, an all member vote within Diem, and we said, we need to do this, hold our nose and vote for Macron, because when a fascist competes against a member of the establishment, we vote for the, for the member of the establishment in order to avoid um, a situation where the fascist takes full control of the instruments of the state. We are not equidistant, in other words. Okay, and there's no conspiracy theory in what we're saying. We're not saying that Le Pen and Macron are conspiring, you know, to play the good cop, bad cop. No, no, they hate each other. There's no doubt that there is a civilized, an anthropological clash between them. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that every morsel of Macron, every cell in his body vibrates with disgust when he sees Le Pen and vice versa. But that's irrelevant. It, from uh, mathematical models of uh, populations, of predators and preys, we know that there is a dynamic between a prey population and a predator population. That as the predators get more successful and eat more of the prey, then that is good for the prey because many of the predators die of hunger. There aren't enough prey to feed them. So the predator population shrinks and that's good for the prey. But then again, as the prey population burgeons, that's good for the remaining predators because there's more for food for them. So there is a feedback effect that is functional to the maintenance of this phony clash between the prey and the predators, between the um, nationalist authoritarians and the establishment authoritarians. In the case of Europe today, but more broadly of other places like Brazil, India, and so on, this feedback effect this permanent choreographed clash between the two forms of authoritarianism, nationalism and establishment authoritarianism, this clash, this orchestrated clash, is functional to the interests of capital accumulation at a time when capital accumulation promotes the rise of a new uber ruling class, the one that Macron ultimately serves with the uh, unwitting support of somebody like Marine Le Pen. Uh, now, I will uh, now comment on Macron's narrative. 
Remember, Macron came into government, promising to transcend the left-right divide. And yet within weeks of being elected president, it was very clear that he was promoting a class war of the rich against the poor. His tax policies were um, aimed at lessening the very low, already very low, tax burden of the wealthy. Uh, his uh, attempt, which he is now going to continue because he was not fully successful, possibly because of the gilet jaune, um, to, to increase the retirement age, is a class war, typical class war attempt to um, jeopardize the living standards of the working class. Let me remind you that the richest amongst the French males have a life expectancy which is 13 years higher than the poorest counterparts. So when you're increasing uniformly the retirement age, uh, this is an element of class war. Um, then remember how he introduced the carbon tax, which sounds great, we want a carbon tax, but we, DM25, proposed that the carbon tax is uh, revenue neutral. That yes, you put a hefty tax on diesel, let's say, because diesel is catastrophic for the environment and for climate change, but every penny that is collected from everybody, poor, rich, middle class, is put into a jar <laughs> in a kitty, and then it's given to the poorest. In other words, the, you introduce a redistributional element to the carbon tax. He didn't. He just slapped a diesel tax. The result was a, something akin to a revolution, the gilet jaune. Um, Macron's neither left nor right narrative has come to haunt him because the youngsters who now clearly voted for Mélenchon um, above Macron, and the ones who didn't vote for Mélenchon uh, voted for Le Pen. So the youngsters, the precariat, and increasingly the proletariat uh, also do not think in terms of left or right, because the left has failed them. Uh, they have taken on the mantle of Macron, neither left or nor right. What they do, however, think is not just Macron versus Le Pen, they differentiate between politicians representing, on the one hand, an oligarchic system which is rigged to hold them back. That's the, the feudal capitalist system that we have that Macron represents. Okay, And those other politicians who claim to want to bring the system down. And for them, it really, very, very, it's a thin red line between Melanchon and Le Pen. They just look at them as disruptors, people that will bring down the system that is holding them back. Now, our capacity as DiEM25, as progressives, to support Macron in the same way that we did 20 years ago. Remember when, I mean, we didn't exist as DiEM25 20 years ago, but some of us are old enough to remember that we had uh, Jacques Chirac, the very right wing conservative, uh, candidate of the Republicans, who in the second round uh, competed against uh, Le Pen's dad, Le Pen's father. And if, in a, even Mélenchon back then came out and said, when you have Chirac versus a fascist, we vote for Chirac, you know, just like we did four years ago. Um, but our capacity to support the non-fascist against the fascist is thinning. It is getting harder and harder to justify doing this. We will still do it. We just voted uh, on a two to one margin, I believe, to, sub, you know, to, to, to recommend to DiEM 25 uh, friends and members that if they have the vote in France, they should vote for Macron, you know, like this again, <laughs> in order to avoid the election of Le Pen. But it's getting harder and harder, and it's getting harder and harder because the argument that, you know, if Macron doesn't win, the racist is going to win, this argument is being depleted, diminished by Macron. Let me remind those who knew it and forgot it, and tell those who never knew it, that 
on the 15th of March of 2021, right, almost a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, I sent a certain gentleman by the name of Gérald Darmanin, the interior minister of the French government, Macron's interior minister, denounced Le Pen for being too soft on immigration. So, hmm? Mr. Macron, you are making it hard for us to vote for you to keep the bastards out because you've turned out to be as great a bastard as any of the bastards of the Nationalist International. And I mean that word, Mr. Macron. And you know that I know you and I used to say good things about you um, because our interaction in 2015 was actually quite amicable and um, civilized. But now you have turned into a bastard because when your interior minister attacks Le Pen for being too soft on immigration, you have gone to the wrong side of the force, mate, to the dark side of the force. Now, we will still vote for you. We decided that on a two-to-one two basis. And for one reason, not because we are not a bastard, because our Arab friends living in France, our black friends living in France, our trans friends living in France, our others living in France, will probably not be able to stomach the idea that Le Pen is going to be able to control the secret police and the police. Their lives will be in jeopardy. They will lose their sleep if you don't win Mr. Macron. This is why we are going to hold our nose and vote for you or recommend to our friends who have a vote in France that they should. Allow me, comrades, to conclude by making a point which is broader than France. Centrists have become toxic. A long time ago, of course, we remember Tony Blair persecuting a genocidal war in Iraq um, from the perspective of the extreme center. But if you think about it over the last, what, 15 years, uh, there have been I'll just give three examples and finish this way. Now, centrists always think of themselves as the custodians of, rebel, of liberal reasonableness. Centrists think of themselves as the custodians of liberal reasonableness. But look at what has happened in Europe since our banks went bankrupt after the 2008 great financial catastrophe. Bailouts were given to banks and to states that were the definition of irrationality. Socialism for the very, very few, austerity for the many, the result was a, a dramatic, precipitous fall in investment. If we don't have green energy today and we rely on Gazprom in Germany, in, in, in Austria and in Italy, it's because of that. These ir highly irrational, stupid, bailouts of the banking sector were extreme in their combination of inefficiency and injustice. And it's a, the, the extreme center that tried to present those irrational bailouts as the epitome of rationality. Look at the pandemic. Thank goodness we had the vaccines. But even with the vaccines being rolled out, we had the liberal establishment sacrificing every basic principle of liberalism for shrill, irrational reasons. The vaccination certificates that became, you know, like you know, holy scripta, uh, even though we knew that the rate of transmission was almost independent of whether you were vaccinated or not in the end. The attempt to create the vilified other amongst those who were you know, worried about vac being vaccinated. I mean, I am a gung-ho supporter of vaccination, but the manner in which the liberal establishment treated the vaccination skeptics, not the mad um, flat earth um, anti-vaccine crowd that saw it as an ideological uh, imperative never to be vaccinated, not them but the vast majority of those who didn't get vaccinated, who were nothing more than just worried people. The way that they were demonized, that is neither liberal nor rational. Effectively, it 
enhanced their reluctance to be vaccinated. And finally, Ukraine. The way in which the extreme center today is demonizing truly rational, moderate positions, calling for a neutral Ukraine within the West, like Austria was during the Cold War. The way we are being demonized or arguing for that, the way that the extreme center is calling for permanent war, for an, the Afghanistan solution, that is, you know, 10-year war in order to defeat Putin and change the regime in Moscow, for supersonic nuclear weapons to be developed, as if that is a problem. I mean, what would we do with them? Use them in uh, Kharkiv and Kyiv. Uh, by the same people who are denying the Ukrainians even a no-fly zone, we have Macron today and the establishment authoritarians as the epitome of shrill, toxic irrationality being pitted against the nationalist international who are constantly a clear and present danger for civilization. This is why DiEM25 is today, and we keep saying this, I keep saying this, more relevant than ever. Our weakness in France today is also a very good, if you want, um, introduction to the rest of the discussion, which must be about why we are failing to turn our correct analysis into action on the ground. Thanks, Yanis, for setting the scene. And yes, that is a, a very important question, and I hope we can tackle that in the, this call. Let me read a couple of comments from people watching us. Um, SWP says people need more articulation as to what's happening in economy and in, in the economy and in economics and politics. Without that articulation, the right wing is always going to spin its populism and conspiracy theories. Uh, someone else says, wouldn't the election, rather controversial idea here, wouldn't the election of a proto-fascist be the necessary push for the mobilization of the left, more so than the party that is maintaining the status quo, which is only fueling the rise of proto-fascists? And KK Mate says, I feel like the central question is, is it easier to fight the establishment slash liberal capitalists or the fascists? Juliana Zita from Germany. Okay, I found the button. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to jump to the, I think, second question um, immediately, the pro-fascist strategy. I think, and for me, to be honest, five years ago, uh, it was more difficult to uh, to cheer for Macron. I think now it's just a completely different time. Um, I think if you vote for Le Pen now, whether you're coming from the ideology um, or you're just anti-establishment, you will people will use her as a wrecking ball. And I think this might be very effective this time. And this is but not what we want. Um, because if she were elected now as a president, uh, we have the war in Ukraine, uh, we have uh, COVID still going, we have an ongoing big crisis uh, that is hitting people very hard economically. Every, uh, all the prices are going up all the time. Everything is super expensive. And I think now she has a perfect stage to do very bold things like uh, exit the NATO, for example, for example, immediately, or partner up with Putin, or, you know, it's very unpredictable what could happen. And I think this writ is not worth a try. I think we cannot, I mean, we won't win either way in this election, because in terms of climate change, you can see that both candidates are horrible for us. Uh, Macron has already decided to build new nuclear plants. Uh, Le Pen is completely also uh, for nuclear power. Uh, she's again against everything else on top. So for us progressives, it's really a horrible election. The outcome will mean that we have to put in more work anyways. Um, if either, either one of them gets elected, only I think that Le Pen uh, could change the situation in Europe in a very drastic way, in, in, if, not for the better, for the worst very quickly. Um, and if I see now, for example, in Germany, we don't have a 
you know, we have a very weird government in Germany right now, <laughs> to be honest. Um, they are a government that is, that is um, well, how, how can I say? It's, it, it's painful to watch these days. They, they don't have a position on, every, on, on anything. It's, uh, Scholz is practically ducking down from every topic. Uh, there is there is a very arrogant communication toward the public, I feel, and um, and yeah, that can inspire the rise of, of of a new wave of IFD in Germany as well, because the dissatisfaction of people is equally high in in Europe. I mean, the elderly people are very poor in many countries. The young people don't have a future, so I think you know electing the, the fascist candidate with hopes that things will change for the better is a very, very dangerous game at this time. Um, and I think it must be avoided. So this would be the first time. And I, I wasn't even, you know, so much pro Biden in the last election in the US, but this is the first time that I'm clearly saying that we have no alternative than to elect, you know, you and France have no alternative than to elect Macron, to be honest. Um, in any other case, um, I think we would see a domino effect in Europe. Um, starting with also Germany, um, with the rise of real fascists, because now I feel that many people who elect fascists are not necessarily from the ideology, but they are just voting out of frustration, which is also, I think, good news for us, because we can pick up from there um, and find ways to communicate better solutions uh, for all those crucial topics uh, and to reach those people and get them back from the fascist party uh, and get them back also from the neoliberal and so-called centrist. So I think this is a big topic everywhere in Europe and um, also here for us in Germany. So it's important what happens in France, I think, on Sunday. Can I ask you one question though on that, Juliana? I mean, where is it that progressives have failed to persuade to, uh, to address those needs? What, what are the things that progressives are, are, are not saying or doing that they ought to be doing in order to have a, a fair, you know, more balance with these far right parties that are doing so well and clearly articulating what people are wanting to hear. Well, one thing is, I think that a lot of left parties were very introverted, like looking in, on the inside, and also, you know, the left and progressives had a lot of meta discussions within the last year, not being very radical in their approach, you know, uh, also. Um, you know, building up boundaries to other groups, like Yannis said before with the vaccines, you know, you're an anti-vaxxer, I'm not talking to you anymore. You know, maybe you're not agreeing on one topic, but it's really crucial that we agree amongst each other on the crucial topics, which, you know, are about how do we live together. So we are really bad, I think, in the progressive side to have an open communication and to really put the finger on those topics which are very urgent for people. I think the urgency is what we sometimes don't see in people's lives. Like people need to pay their bills now. And if we go in with meta discussions about any other thing, they won't listen to us. And so populists win very easy if they just you know, prioritize and say, yeah, we are talking to, to poor working class that's working very well for us. And on the other side, the working class, I think, would like a left, a strong left party, and also saying that here for Germany. I mean, we have now Mera 25 in Germany, lucky for Germany, but uh, you know what, what has happened to Die Linke in Germany is still devastating. Thank you, Juliana. Gabrielle Frafin from France. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I want to try to answer this question as well. Um, um, the question that you asked to Juliana, what, what are progressives are not doing right? Uh, why is the far right rising and not us? Um, and the way I see it, especially in France, is that the left is coming from years of talks, uh, years of promises that are never followed through. Um, we shouldn't forget that only five years ago, supposedly the left was in power in France, right? Um, and I think people are just tired of listening um, to these promises that are never followed through. And what we're really missing as radical leftists is um, 
building already prefigurative politics. So already building resistance and already building the alternative in the cracks of the system right now to show, and not just to talk, to show what we mean to people, because I think people don't believe us anymore. And rightly so, to be honest. And they want to see what, what, what we mean, what alternative we mean. Um, and that's really, I mean, I guess that's also self-criticism. Um, that's really what I want to see with movements like DM. It's already building the alternative. We can't wait anymore. And I mean, the environment was just uh, was just mentioned. We can't wait anymore. So let's build build the resistance in the cracks, build the alternative in, in, in the cracks of the systems because they already exist. Um, and so that's really what I'm seeing that is missing from, from our side um, and from, from the radical left. Um, and maybe as an example of something uh, of what I'm what I mean is um is in the Canary Islands that um they, they were having a big and still are I think having a bit, a bit housing crisis um and a group of anarchists that was you know I mean not popular within the within the work the workers there um they they showed them they uh, squatted buildings, they built a tenant union and helped the people, the workers that were not politicized, that were completely against politics and completely in complete apathy. Um, they helped them get a house, as simple as that, right? <laughs> like people need a house, let's give them a house. People need healthcare, let's build our own, like our resistance networks around healthcare. Um, and, and really it worked and the, the movement now is really massive in the Canary Islands out of, out, out of nowhere. They just grew this um, anarchist federation um, and, um, and, you know, gave people what they needed and put practice. And I think also Yanis mentioned this, like completely failed in practice. And that's what we need. Like people don't need ideologies anymore. People need, don't need another, um, yeah, strand of Marxism. People need actual material conditions to get better. Um, so that would be my my two cents on 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 what's happening um, right thank now. Thank you, thank you, Gabriel. Good point. And maybe to mention yep. in the meeting, Go yeah. Um, since so we need to build these uh, this resistance and uh, and these alternatives. Uh, we're um, straight after this intense election period. We're having um, for the. Uh, Paris region members on Monday uh, at 7 p.m. on the 25th of April, we're having a meeting to to brainstorm about how we can build this resistance, uh, and uh, and that will be the first meeting for other meetings for all around France to rebuild these local collectives and uh, be there against hope, hopefully Macron. Um, uh, yeah, straight away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. Um, absolutely. And, and, and a good point there on actually building the alternative as opposed to just pushing for it. Um, so if you'd like to be part of that and you're in France, please join DM25. DM25.org slash join is the address. And you'll immediately get information about that meeting that you could um, you could attend. Dushan, you had a quick response you wanted to make to Gabrielle. Go for it. Dushan yes, Payevich. Sir. Modern. Thanks, Gabriel, for, for inspiration and thanks, Mehran. Uh, I just wanted to add that I think, yes, that is the crucial thing, that extreme right plays on the emotions while left plays on the logic. And emotions are much more powerful, powerful than logic and unfortunately they are doing it good. I mean, they are funneling the anger towards immigrants, LGBTQ plus people, women, and so immigrants, and so on, and so on, uh, while they are not really the ones to be targeted. So we need to funnel that anger, sadness, despair towards the 1%, towards the people that are actually responsible for the conditions uh, regular people are living in. And uh, not also that, not just to touch upon negative emotions, but also to talk about different alternatives to present them in practice, to present them in doing, in animations, in whatever 
possible tools we can make in order to present to people what the alternative looks like. Not just critique of this current system and not just statistics and analysis, but let's present uh, post-capitalism or uh, anarcho-syndicalism or anarcho-corporativism or whatever uh, with any tools that we have available. And uh, let me just say to our comrades in France that right came to power in Montenegro right after the establishment was ruling for 30 years. And all of the deals between, uh, well, establishment between uh, corporate, corporations and polluters didn't fall through. They continued. So the nationalist was doing the same except they also added the additional layer of xenophobia, of nationalism, of extreme uh, religious affinity and similar stuff. So none of these exploitations are going to stop. They are just going to have another layers of hatred. So unfortunately, pick your nose, I mean, uh, put a hand on your nose and vote for Macron. Yes. Hold your nose as opposed to pick your nose, but I know what you mean. Yes, thank you, Dushan. And a quick comment on that. Um, that's something that the, the left, in terms of like building alternatives, there's a lot of movement activity in terms of building those alternatives, but there's a, there's a PR component to that of, of actually showing people, look, this is what we're doing. We're doing this to lead by example, and you can do the same. There's a lot of PR around it that I think um, I don't see very often from progressives and from the left. They just go out and build the alternative because there's an urgent need, whether it's saving refugees or creating housing or things like that. So um, I, th I think that's a, a point which is another shortfall from progressives. Julia, Julia Moore, UK, from the UK, but based in France. In, indeed. Thank you, Miran. Thank you. Um, yeah, so following on from, from colleagues um, with a different uh, type of analysis, as Miran said, I'm, a, I'm an expat living in the south of France uh, from the UK. Uh, for people who are watching this, who are not familiar with the uh, mainland history, France and, and the UK, uh, historically medieval times, had been almost part of the same country. The kings and queens, we shared a common court. And there are some very interesting historical parallels that are coming out in our sort of modern experience here. And I'll, I'll return to Brexit just just um, uh, just as I finish. But just to give a flavour here for people who may not uh, sort of have an angle of the geography, uh, France, uh, comparative to the UK, same rough same population, around about 60 million, um, five times the geographical land mass. Um, which is now divided into 18 administrative departments, five of which are offshore, Guadeloupe, La Martinique, etc. So, um, as our colleagues this evening have been saying, uh, the political history uh, of the diverse groups which fall away in elections and become where we are, the, the, different, the, the choice that we have of the, the right um, and uh, the, the centrist, the toxic centrist of Macron, um, does not bear out the observation if one is lucky enough to travel around France and, and move in and out of rural communities, suburban communities and the metropolitan communities. As Mirren has just said, there is a beehive of community activity when people are very clear when there's a need and I'm not just talking about the current Ukraine system and I've been very proud I'm in a very right wing part of of the Cote d'Azur and compared to contrasting to the UK the speed with which Ukrainian families have been welcomed children have been integrated into school with full interpretation translating assistance routes into employment uh, bearing in mind language issues the provision of French and English um, almost instantly free beauty treatments free hairdressing uh, and accommodations as, as Juliana was saying in other respects very proud this is in a right-wing area which doesn't sit comfortably with the racist blah, 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 that we're seeing that came out for example that was used as a mechanism in in the UK's Brexit so there's an interesting uh, paradox there and I think what what Miran pulled together just now and I just want to say is that if we can 
uh, as the progressive, uh, the leader of progressive narrative, if we can somehow capture that, clearly the 12 million uh, blank votes of the last election, remember our colleague Sreshko Horvat, last time we were talking four years ago with this, has said 12 million people, that is one hell of a new potential political party that we have still yet to capitalise on, but we have better mechanisms now and we're getting better and I think we can do this as far as France is concerned, because there's a will to activism out there. Gilets jaunes is a fantastic modern example, but just the everyday people who go out, see a need, provide things, providing a mobile cinema up in a rural um, environment that I go to quite um, frequently where there's no hope unless volunteers had got together to organise the showing of popular films etc because that wouldn't be provided. There's an entire network of people providing need as Juliana has just identified. Now we have got mechanisms now, we've got our voting systems, we've got our policy processes, we've got our campaign offers and if we can somehow knit that natural calls to activism of these people and there may be more after Sunday when we finally know what the statistics are of voting those people have energy and it needs to go somewhere and we the progressive left um, can find that simple narrative and drag that narrative away from the simple and toxic message of the right from an opinion from an expat living in France thanks Miriam that's it from me thank you Julia well said. Lucas Febraro, based in Berlin, from Brazil. Thank you, Maren. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, to go back quickly to the, to the question that someone asked in the, in the chats that um, Juliana um, already uh, answered, answered to at, at, uh, at length. But uh, just to offer the perspective, um, you know, coming from a country that unfortunately has had Jair Bolsonaro as its, as its president for the, for the past few years, what it looks like when an actual uh, proto-fascist is in power in your country. So first of all, in terms of how does that change the political landscape? Uh, what we have seen in Brazil is uh, now, you know, uh, Lula who had been imprisoned uh, has been freed, so thankfully, and he will be uh, running in the, in the elections later this year. And he's going to be the main opponent of, uh, of Bolsonaro. But what we're seeing is, a broad alliance being created between the, the left or the center left, or even like uh, sectors that used to be pretty hard left a few, a few years ago with the establishment and with the center right. And you just have to look at uh, Lula, for example, um, who is, you know, obviously he was president for two terms. He is uh, an a politician of the establishment in some way. Uh, but he's going to share his ticket now with uh, Gerardo Alckmin, who is the former governor of Sao Paulo from, from the right, uh, who Lula beat, in fact, in, in uh, 2006 to win his second term. Um, and we're seeing that across uh, the, the political landscape, uh, politicians sort of flocking to alliances with the establishment uh, under the pretense that we need to be united to, to beat Bolsonaro now. Um, I'm very skeptical that uh, this, is a, this is a good thing in the end. I'm, I'm obviously, I'm completely for Bolsonaro being thoroughly beaten by, as it's probably going to be, Lula. But, you know, uh, Lula doesn't need to forge those alliances to beat Bolsonaro. Lula is, a, is, is an electoral phenomenon almost uh, without equal in the, in the world. Um, so it's, it's ironic also because uh, the coup that happened in Brazil in 2016 was supported by those uh, people who the left are now um, forging alliances with in order to be Bolsonaro. So, you know, I think this feedback loop that we're talking about that uh, Jan is mentioned in the, in the opening, it works both ways. When the fascists are in power, um, unfortunately, it still uh, keeps on going. And then in terms of what has actually happened, um, um, speaking of the, the actions that Bolsonaro actually took when he was in power, well, you know, uh, has he been an enemy of uh, workers? Yes, absolutely. But so has been the establishment, you know, historically. Um, the right has, uh, you know, especially in the 90s, has done um, nothing but uh, hurt to workers uh, as well. Um, has it been a disaster for minorities? Yes, absolutely. You know, um, there's still widespread racism in Brazil. The police is uh, massacring uh, Black people in the, in the favelas and in the slums which again, um, already happened before. It already, it just happens more 
more openly now and the numbers have have gone up a bit and the acceleration is racist you know like i, I don't know um, i don't think that's a controversial thing to say look at the uk for example they want to ship asylum seekers to rwanda now like uh, their sacks of potatoes um, and you know the social democrats the social democrats in denmark uh, want to want to do the same and i think it's a great idea so in those senses it's just neoliberalism but supercharged you know but uh, I think where it changes a bit is what if something unexpected comes up and while well, those people are in power? Imagine for a cycle, for example, that uh, a virus, a deadly virus gets on the loose somewhere in the world and then starts going around the planet. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the establishment, you know, with all these defects might have handled the situation a little bit better. Well, when you have Bolsonaro, you have over half a million deaths in, in the country. So I think because of those contingencies, uh, we should still, you know, um, be supporting the establishment when the choice is binary, as it unfortunately often is between fascists and the, and the establishment as we have in, in, in France now. Um, and then lastly, just to keep this a little bit more uh, productive, hopefully, I wanted to talk about what is it that we can do? Uh, well, in terms of what we can actually do in terms of actions, I think uh, uh, Gabriel already and, and Dushan uh, talked about it wonderfully. I wanted to just very briefly talk about how we can um, speak and uh, project ourselves and if there's anything that we might learn from those people, if uh, anything at all. I actually do think, and this might be controversial, but I think there's a lot that we can learn from the far right in that sense, because you know, uh, there's nothing that we can learn ideologically from them, but in terms of communications, it's been working for them. So uh, if there's anything that we can take for them, we should. And I think what they do that the left doesn't do enough, in my opinion, is they're approachable, they're personable. They have terrible ideas, you know, horrific ideas, but because they come across as regular people, um, they, they're able to sell those to people who, you know, in the past in Brazil, for example, used to support Lula. Because again, Lula is a personable person. He's, a, he's similar to Bolsonaro in that sense. So I think uh, there's a lesson here that, you know, has been learned in Europe by people like Salvini, for example, and in the US by people like Trump, who should be the least personal, personable person in the world because, you know, he's a billionaire who is completely out of touch with uh, how regular people live. But uh, he's been able to surpass that just based on the way that he acts and the way that he talks, not on, on the things that he, that he does. So um, if there is any lesson that we can uh, take here for, uh, for ourselves, I think that would be it, that we should be um, approachable, we should be personable, we shouldn't be afraid of using humor here and there to uh, get our points across. And then uh, hopefully we can uh, still at least a little bit of the, of the territory that we've lost to the, to the right in the past few decades. Thank you, Lucas, for detailing the experiences in your country and also for that important point about what can progressives learn from the far right in terms of tactics, not in terms of ideology. So if you've got ideas on this out there, please put them in the chat as well. And of course, uh, the panel here, if you've got specific uh, suggestions on this front, then please put them in. Judith Meyer from Germany. I would like to... Um have a moment uh, of silence uh, for uh, the pollster profession. Because um, in this uh, situation where you have, uh, as uh, Lucas and also Jana said, a feedback loop between two people, and these two people are also uh, the only choice, a binary choice between these two people, you cannot have uh, accurate polls. Uh, we saw this uh, with uh, Brexit, we saw this uh, with Trump, um, the polls uh, thought that uh, Hillary would win by uh, four or five percent. Uh, same for Brexit. No, for Brexit, the poll before the before the Brexit referendum actually predicted ten percent uh, in favor of uh, of Remain. Um, I mean, ten percent more, fifty five to uh, to forty five. Um, it's not uh, possible to to accurately uh, predict and stay right about it uh, if you have a binary choice, which also affects. Uh, each other, um, because the only reason people vote uh, for the establishment option is because uh, they want to prevent the other option. And the only reason people vote for the other option is because they want to prevent the establishment. So as soon as you will release a poll that says uh, Trump is going to win, 
uh, immediately Hillary gets more votes. As soon as you say uh, Brexit is going to win, immediately more people are going to show up uh, to, to vote against uh, Brexit. Uh, so whatever you predict, it will be wrong. Uh, and the same goes for the other, uh, other prediction. So, um, and this is because uh, people are not voting for something they want, they only vote against something that uh, they don't want. We need to get back to voting for, for what we really want, but obviously it's not possible when there's only a binary option. So uh, the postal profession is dead. We don't know what will happen. And that means uh, that uh, as progressives, uh, we should assume uh, the worst option and we should uh, behave in such a way that we would still be happy if the worst came to pass. So for this election in France, let's say, um, we assume that uh, Le Pen is gonna win. What do we want to have done ahead of that. Uh, for Europe, um, for America, you know, a lot of people uh, it, back in, uh, say, 2018 or so, they were saying there's no way that uh, people will, uh, will re-elect uh, Trump. Okay, let's assume that uh, he's going to win the next presidential election. Let's assume he's going to win the next midterms. Let's prepare. Uh, let's do what we feel we need to do uh, in this kind of situation, because there's no other way. We, we're not going to get uh, accurate information from the polls. Uh, and the only thing that we can do is to live uh, in such a way that uh, we won't regret. Thank you. You did. And it's so true. Even since the Scottish referendum before Brexit, the polls have been way off. The system just isn't built to handle disruptors and almost promotes the idea of... Uh, spectating and just hoping that the far right candidate or the far right position isn't going to win. And that's not what progressives should be doing, just sitting and watching. We should be getting in there. If you want to get in there and organize and, and confront this problem, dm25.org slash join is one important action that you can take. It'll take you a few seconds and you can join the fight with us. Who's next? Eric Edmund, based in Brussels half Greek, half Swedish. That's right. Thanks. Hi, Mehran, everybody. Um, you did is uh, totally spot on. And if you noticed the, the first poll that came out that gave uh, Macron something like a 10 point uh, head over Le Pen, the first thing Macron did was to come out and say that nothing's decided, everything's uncertain and so on, exactly to prevent people from not turning out to vote because they think it's pre-decided. That, that is the biggest sort of enemy of, of Macron's campaign right now, this sense of nobody's going to be crazy enough to, to vote for, for the authoritarians when the alternative is, is Macron, even if they don't like him, which is, you know, the same kind of narrative that you had with Brexit, for example. You know, who on earth would ever vote for Brexit? A lot of people, I remember the first few weeks and months after Brexit, were coming out saying, oh, I can't believe I didn't go to vote. Um, because they thought it was uh, pre-decided. So th this, th this is completely true. However, I wanted to speak to something else that's been sort of already touched upon. Um, first of all, a binary narrative only benefits the two sides of that binary. So in this case, the extreme center, Macron, um, and the far right, Le Pen. And the more the threat of one or the other is being highlighted ex and extenuated, the more one of those two sides wins. And unfortunately, I think the left has been working its narrative a lot around the people it opposes. And unfortunately, it is never seen as the main opposition to any of those enemies. So the more we talk about how terrifying Le Pen is, the more we are empowering Macron. And the more we're talking about Macron, the more we're empowering Le Pen. And nobody's considering us as an alternative to either because we're not seen as, as, as a likely candidate to win. So I think one of the big mistakes that the left has been making is to talk a lot about the people we oppose and not so much about our own narrative, our own uh, goals, uh, what we are trying to, to, to achieve instead of what is already in place to make ourselves more credible and to establish ourselves more as, as political actors. I think that's point number one, on top of a myriad of other issues, including you know how divided we are and so on and so forth. However, with this in mind, here I would like to, to speak a bit or to push back a little bit to, to what uh, Gabriel and, uh, and Dushan were saying about uh, grassroots. 
and that you know people don't need another strand of Marxism. And I agree in terms of the narrative. People don't want to hear about another strand of Marxism, and that's the last thing we should be talking about. In the same way that we shouldn't be talking about another strand of anarcho-communist syndicalism or whatever. Um, it's not the theory that is important. It's not necessarily the policies. What Luke has been saying about how you present yourself, how you 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 formulate and you frame what it is you stand for. However, this idea of giving up the mainstream political game and focusing only at the local level and creating those alternatives within a system that is ringed against those alternatives is giving up the bigger game, I think. And I think that's problematic because that is essentially what the left has systemically been doing for the past few decades, as it sees its chances of mainstream political victories um, crumble. So we are retreating away from the real fight and we are adapting to a hostile environment and how we can make the most of it rather than overcoming it. So although I agree that we as DiEM especially, we should be better established at the local level. We should be working a lot on grassroots actions, developing all those things. Um, it's important to also maintain a narrative and a, a bigger framework for a more systemic change. Because if we don't do that, we are essentially giving up that game so that the next time we have elections, we again need to have an all member vote about whether we're gonna abstain or have Macron for another four years. And, and that can't be the case anymore. You know, The left needs to pick up its self-confidence and re-enter that, uh, that discussion as a, not somebody who is scraping by to get into the second round, but as the left of the past, the left that was one of the two main candidates to win the presidency uh, and not to sort of normalize this kind of loser ideology and, and giving up um, that part of the of the political arena. Thank you, Eric. Um, good points all. A couple of comments from the chat now. Zap Zen this, with the proposals that what can progressives learn from the far right in terms of tactics was the question. Zap Zen says, fight them with the language of millennials, memes. Yes, that Brazilian guy, Lucas Fibraro, is uh, the master of this and uh, very happy that he's on board. Winston Fetner says, progressives should learn how to be populist. Populism shouldn't be a dirty word because it doesn't have to be a precursor of fascism. It can be a force for reform. Agreed. And Apre Ku says, what, what progressives can learn from progressives like Bernie is a better question, DM25. Um, well, we have fortunately very good links with Bernie Sanders via our sister organization, the Progressive International, but take your point there also. Any other comments from people here? Perhaps, perhaps Amir Kiai, our policy coordinator, would like to offer some reflections on, on policy. Uh, thank you, Mehran. <laughs> well, this is um, when we look at the Green New Deal for Europe, which is a flagship policy uh, of the movement. It actually begins with the establishing of the, from a grassroots point of view, the thousands upon thousands of local assemblies and spaces of discussion and pressure points to, to, to bring down pressure on existing current forces that, uh, that, that we have in terms of the local governments, if you like, or national level, and so on. So we actually are beginning in our policy terms from the grassroots pushing upwards and talking about uh, uh, allowing the local population, the local uh, regional framework and so forth, imagining that where people are coming together and deciding about their utilities, about how the uh, renationalized water or housing or whether uh, public transport, inf public infrastructure should be handled and what decisions should be made. In the Netherlands, for example, in the recent national elections, the, the, the VVD came to power already promising the creation of a few nuclear power plants. That's only going to benefit the oligarchy, as we know. Whereas um, uh, in the most recent elections locally, uh, some of you might know that Meta, Facebook, uh, wanted to establish a data center here. And of course, the people rose up to that and they, through the local elections, 
voted in a local party that effectively canceled the whole meta Facebook project. So it is possible. So whether it be organizing locally, regionally or nationally, we've actually laid the plans out already in our Green Deal for Europe program. We have the people's gathering process where members can get uh, can join in and invite non-DM25 members to take part and discuss solutions to their problems. So we all have it laid out. So please join us and let's make this happen. Thank you, Amir. Well, we're reaching the top of the hour. Yanis, can I bring you back in for a few closing words? Very few, very few. I agree entirely that we need to learn lessons from right-wing populists. Uh, the fundamental lesson we have to learn is that um, being on the margins does not excuse us for not winning. The, you know, Donald Trump won against uh, the whole panoply of the media system in the United States with far less money than Hillary Clinton. Similarly, you know, the Brexiteers, they had less money, they had fewer institutional backers than uh, the Remainers. I'm very sad that those people won. But our lesson is that um, there are no excuses for, for losing. The fact that, you know, let's face it, we of the left have always tried to find excuses in the in, in our exclusion from the media, from uh, the circles of money, of finance, all these are handicaps. But the extreme right has shown that they can be overcome. We showed that in Greece in 2015, even briefly for five months. So no excuses made. You know, we have to, comrades, we have to, we, we, we've got to, you know, put our money, little money, where our mouth is, our big mouth is, and, and, and win. So that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, uh, I will um, go against the grain of something that was said in the chat and which Meron approvingly conveyed. No, there is no such thing as left-wing populism. We must never confuse populism with being popular. We need to be popular. Uh, of course, it depends on how you define populism. But my definition of populism is to promise everybody whatever it is that they want to hear to be all things to all people. That is right wing. That is um, uh, disrespectful of the uh, electorate. We need to look at people in the eye and say to them, okay, this is what we want to do. These are the large costs that we're going to have to suffer in order to do it. But this is also why it's an excellent investment for the, for the future, because that's what the definition of investment is. Uh, you suffer a cost today, you forfeit some satisfaction or some something which is comfortable, some comfort today in order to achieve a larger price in the future. Uh, in that sense, we are not populist and we never will be. We do not um, stroke the ears and uh, lull uh, people into a false sense that everything is uh, going to be fine. No. Uh, the struggle is going to be difficult. There are costs involved in a rebellion against the system. The system is going to bite the heads off or the heads of many of us off, uh, but it's worth it. It's worth it because you know, a life of stagnation and, and permanent subservience um, while the planet is burning uh, is not worth it. So let's win. Thank you, Yanis. Okay, um, well, that concludes our session for today. Um, a couple of little housekeeping issues. If you're a DM25 member, um, this week we're, well, it's the culmination of a, of a long process of, um, of reworking from the ground up our founding documents, our, uh, our manifesto, and our operating principles. And of course, this is DM25. Members decide. The big decisions in this organization and you should please vote if you haven't yet the deadline for voting i think is april 24th right judith yep april 24th so we've got four you've got four days left to vote on whether to approve the the crowd sourced uh, crowd edited um version that's uh, being put towards you of the operating principles 
and the manifesto. Uh, another thing, we've got a new show coming up, which I'll be hosting, which is Frontline, interviews with people who are confronting power um, to learn about how they do it. The first one will be dropping in the next couple of days. And of course, you, if you would like to join DM25, if you'd like to be active with DM25 or just donate to DM25 and help us put that little money to good use that Jan has just referred to, then please do. The um, address is dm25.org slash join. As mentioned before, it will only take you a couple of seconds and you can be part of it, taking it to the establishment and fending off the far right. Thank you again for watching. See you at the same time, same place. Two weeks from now, it will be on a Tuesday though, not a Wednesday, so not exactly the same time. This time was one day late. So not next Tuesday, the following Tuesday. Okay, thank you. Take care and stay safe.